Hi, it's Fraser Myers here, Deputy Editor of Spiked. Before we kick off this week's Brendan O'Neill show, I have something very exciting to announce. Spiked is launching an internship program. We're offering paid placements to aspiring writers, podcasters, and video makers who want to cut their teeth at the best political magazine in the world. You'll work with us full-time for six months in London starting this July, and there's the possibility of more work at the end of it. You can apply for an editorial internship where you'll help us to produce our articles, features and essays or an audio visual internship where you'll help us to produce our videos and podcasts like this one. To find out more and to apply, just go to spiked-online.com forward slash interns. That's spiked-online.com forward slash interns. What happened during the pandemic was a small group of scientists who unfortunately led and controlled incredible amounts of of policy and funding, decided they knew the right thing and that any opposition was itself ipso facto dangerous. So you have a situation where there really is, we really do need every single mind focused on this. And at that single moment, a small group of people decide they know best, that they can organize all of society around their wisdom, their knowledge, and that anyone that opposes them is dangerous. And they got their way with the policy. They got their lockdowns. Hello, and welcome to the Brendan O'Neill Show with me, Brendan O'Neill. This is a podcast in which an esteemed guest joins me to talk about the big ideas, the bad ideas, the problems, and the controversies of life in the early 21st century. In this episode, I am delighted to be joined by Jay Bhattacharya. Jay is a professor of medicine at Stanford University and a research associate at the National Bureau of Economics Research. He is also director of Stanford's Center for Demography and Economic of health and aging. His research focuses on the health and well-being of vulnerable populations, with an emphasis on the role of government programs, biomedical innovation and economics. Jay has been one of the most prominent critics of lockdown as a response to COVID-19. He co-authored the Great Barrington Declaration with Martin Kulldorff and Sunitra Gupta. That declaration called for a strategy of focused protection, where society's resources would be pushed towards the elderly and the vulnerable who required the most protection from COVID-19. So Jay, I want to start off by asking you about where you think things currently stand in relation to COVID-19 and the lockdowns. Because one thing that strikes me and and worries me to a certain extent is that I get the impression lots of people are so relieved that the lockdown period is over for most of us, not if you live in Shanghai, but for most people, it's kind of coming to an end. They're so relieved it's over. They're so bamboozled by that two-year period in human history. And I think that that sense of relief has led some people to want to forget about what happened and to move on to the next stage of life and to kind of put it behind them. And I I worry sometimes that that will that will grate against the kind of reckoning we probably need to have with this vast experiment that was conducted on huge sections of the population. Am I right to worry about that? Do you think people are moving on, where do you think things currently are in relation to the experience of lockdown? I I agree with you that a lot of people are moving on. A lot of people do definitely want to forget what's happened. The absolutely catastrophic harms to the poor, the working class, um, put that under the rug, Uh, the the violations of basic civil liberties, all that. In fact, I've seen this effort to sort of gaslight people into thinking that the, those those violations of civil liberties, those harms to the poor, the working class, never actually happened. Mm. Um, but I think it's going to fail, Brendan, and, and I'll tell you why. I, I, the harms are too great, and the uh, the, the sort of like uh, uh, moving away from our norms was so severe that it it cries out for a postmortem evaluation, a very careful, honest one. Um, and I think that's going to come. I do think, you know, it's, it's normal in human psychology to have a period of, of, uh, you know, relaxation a little bit after, after a big trauma. But I don't think that this is going away. The, the echo of the lockdown harms are, are continuing to this day. Uh, in, in the United States, in, in particular, in school closures and the, the harm to children, um, just everywhere, I think, uh, we're, we're seeing this. And, and the failure to actually prevent the harms from COVID itself 
Um, so I think I think that's coming. Uh, I think um, it may take a political movement to do that. Uh, I, I mean, I think in the UK, you, I've seen you already are having a, a terms of inquiry over over COVID, and there's some fight over that. Uh, that hasn't yet truly been engaged in the US. But I think over the course of the next a few months, especially with the uh, American election coming in November, that also will start to engage. I think every country on earth will have to take a very close look at its its response and, uh, and be honest with the public about what happened. Uh, absolutely. Let's dig into some of those catastrophic harms that you just mentioned in passing there. You were a critic of the policy of lockdown, one of the most articulate critics of it, in my view. And um, I want to talk about the Great Barrington Declaration and some other ideas I- in a moment. But firstly, let's think about some of the impact that this had, because one of the things I find incredibly annoying is the notion that I still hear from fellow journalists and people in the political sphere that lockdown was necessary, the impact of it has been exaggerated, letting the virus rip as if that's what people like us wanted to do would have been far, far worse. And there is, as you say, there is a reluctance among sections of the influential sections of society to grapple with some of the impacts that lockdown has had. So let's talk about some of them. You mentioned their school closures, the uh, suspension of children's learning. Um, Can you speak a little bit about uh, the impact you think that has had on children in the US, which you will be more familiar with, but on on the whole idea of a child's right to education and their right to expand their knowledge? We just violated that. It was as if the the all the the words about the importance of education, the vital importance of it in, in invest as an investment into the, the futures of our children were were just words. You know, the most shocking thing is that it was so deeply unequal, mm-hmm. right? So, uh, if you lived in the United States, if you lived in a blue state, I live in California. There, I my son sent my kids to public school. You know, government schools for eighteen months, they had nothing near that normal schooling experience. But you know, they're in some sense fortunate. I could help uh, replace that with some, you know, with my wife and I. We could talk to them, oversee them, help them out. You know, it's not it doesn't that a full replacement for school. But if you're poor, you you couldn't do that. You were faced with a decision between overseeing your kids' schooling or feeding your family, right? And the consequence of that for the kids is enormous. Uh, there's was lo- long literature prior to the pandemic that showed that. Even small, short interruptions in schooling can have profound consequences on the life of children. They live live shorter lives, less healthy lives, poorer lives as a consequence. Schooling is our probably the single best social investment we make, and we threw it away. Uh, and the, I mean, the U.S. is bad. And I'll tell you, I'm, I'm more, even more worried about poor countries. Uganda, four and a half million children are never going to come back to school after two years of closed schools. Bangladesh closed schools for 18 months, India closed schools for 18 months. The consequences for the next generation are just staggering. And, you know, I've seen some education folks talk about how, uh, you know, kids are resilient and we can make this up. I think it's just Pollyannish. I mean, I think we we do absolutely need to make enormous investments to try to make it up. But let's be honest, it's not ever going to be really, truly made up. Yeah, I think that's right about the well, the global disparity in terms of the the devastation of education was far more pronounced in poorer parts of the world even than it was in the West. And I want to get onto global disparities in a moment. But also within the West itself, as you've mentioned there, there was always this class disparity in the lockdown, which very few people, including people on the left who traditionally have been interested in issues of class, were willing to talk about and were willing to face up to. So you mentioned in relation to education in the US, the shutting down of education had a more dire impact on working class and and poorer families. It's the exact same situation in the United Kingdom, where the education of working class kids has been put even further back than the education of upper middle class kids who, who could make up for it within the home. I want to ask you about other class disparities that existed in the lockdown. And I guess the question here is, whether there was a lockdown at all in a fundamental sense, because as you and others have pointed out, there are some jobs that cannot be done from home. There are some jobs that entail people going out and stacking shelves and making food and emptying garbage cans, dustbins, and so on. So wasn't there built into the lockdown, even if it was never outwardly expressed, a class differential between those who could afford to stay at home and supposedly be safe, and those who were sent out into the world, even though we were told 
there was this uh, horrific virus that was very, very dangerous. You're absolutely right. Uh, so in, in the early days of the epidemic, there were some economists that did this careful analysis of how, what fraction of jobs in the United States could actually be replaced by work from home. Uh, it turns out about 30%. So, and it's those 30% that benefited the most from the lockdowns. I mean, or at least were harmed the least by the lockdowns. You know, you had a this very incredible situation where young, relatively young professionals, well off with jobs that could be done remotely, were being served by older people. Mm. You know, DoorDash or you know, food food delivery. Uh, they protected themselves. The, the the laptop class protected itself just fine, while the the rest of society basically had to face the risk. It was the most unequal policy. I, I, I mean, it's hard, it's hard. I'm trying to like avoid superlatives because it's just, you know, you, the audience thinks, okay, it's just, you know, he's just uh, hyperbolic, but I don't think so. I think here really is, is we took this class division and then we turned it into a virtue. Yeah. If you're, if you can stay home, you stay safe, you're virtuous. If you're not, if you can't, you're not being careful. There's something wrong with you. Actually, we've, it's, it's like a, an establishment of a caste system in Western society. Uh, you know, you have this, and, it, and you've seen this through the whole pandemic, you know, clean and unclean, right? You see essential, non-essential, can stay safe, can't stay safe, masked, unmasked, vaccinated, unvaccinated, boosted, not boosted, all, all of these like distinctions, very closely related to class, of course. But, you know, what, what Western society in the past has suppressed those kinds of clean and unclean differences. If we, we have this conceit that we are all equal. Um, and during the pandemic, that was thrown away. Yeah. And the dynamic in the UK was the exact same. And we had a situation where some of the most vociferous supporters of lockdown, journalists who write for broadsheet newspapers or uh, people who work in the political sector or the think tank sector, they were being served by people who still had to go outside. They were having their meals delivered. They were having their refuse collected. They were eating food that was still being prepared by people who had to go into workplaces and factories in order to make that food. So as you say, the the class distinction that always exists in some ways, was just so graphically brought to the surface and made into a virtue, made into something that you were good if you stayed at home, you were bad if you went out. Another impact, of course, and I think this is the kind of impact which, as you said at the beginning, there will have to be a reckoning with lockdown because it's the consequences are building up all of the time. And one of those is the health impact of lockdown and the suspension of some forms of healthcare, or at least the signal that was sent to the public that if you're a good person, you won't bother the health service for these two years. You'll stay at home and and just suffer if you're if you're in pain or if you feel unwell. Uh, in the UK, the message was save the NHS, stay at home, and we're seeing now in the UK that there is a huge backlog of people who have not been treated for serious ailments. Lots of cancers appear to have gone undetected, or certainly they've been detected far later than they would have been in a normal period. And I'm sure there's a similar situation in the, in the US and elsewhere. What do you think the consequences will be of devoting the health services around the world so myopically on COVID rather than on general health? So I'll address some of the specific health needs, I think, which are you are absolutely right, are, are gargantuan right now um, because of our lack of attention to basic preventative health care and other other kinds of health care. Let me just say one thing about, about that rhetoric of save the NHS. It, it, it represents an inversion of what we normally think of as the relationship between medical people and healthcare people and the, and the public. The medical profession I entered, I thought we vowed to serve the public. We ser vowed to serve the people. When you say something like save the NHS is, is a virtue itself. That, what essentially says the public then serves medical people. It's an inversion of the normal responsibility, just a sacred responsibility, I think, of medical people who enter the medical profession to serve people, even, even at risk to themselves. And many of them did, I should, just, we should be clear, right? Many people in the NHS and in frontline healthcare workers did in the early days of the pandemic, not knowing what the risk of the virus was, nevertheless came and took care of people. I think that is that we absolutely should honor them. Mm -hmm. But that's an honor that comes from a sacrifice that they decide to make to the, to, through their vows to, to serve the public. To re invert that actually, I think is quite dangerous. So now, now on the specific questions about like what the, what the, the consequences for, for health, I think that both 
physical and psychological health has been devastatedly harmed by the, the lockdowns, right? So you mentioned cancer. That has absolutely has happened in the U.S. Like uh, people skipped basic things like mammography, and which have resulted in women showing up with late stage breast cancer that should have been picked up in early stages in previous in la- last year. Uh, diabetes management went by the wayside, especially during in 2020, so that, you know, diabetics, if you don't carefully manage blood sugar, you're going to get bad outcomes. You're going to get kidney failure. You're going to get uh, a diabetic retinopathy. You're going to get all kinds of, uh, you know, ca- cardiovascular disease that's actually preventable. And now there are stories, of course, of people d- dying from heart attacks because they were at home, because they were so scared to go to the hospital. Um, lots and lots of, of a big, I know there's in the UK, a big increase in deaths at home relative to deaths in hospitals it's because a lot of those probably were preventable because they had, they had they gone to the hospital. So you have both direct effects of lockdowns, the effects of fear mongering and this propaganda to, to protect the NHS, where, which inverts um, the relationship. The psychological harms are, are also incredible, right? So in, in the US, in um, June of 2020, a CDC survey found that one in four young adults, 18 to 24, had seriously considered suicide that month. The, the numbers are, are, if anything, worse, have gotten worse over time. The level of depression and anxiety in survey after survey are through the roof in the United States, and I imagine in the UK as well. And I think it's not surprising when you panic the population, when you create this sort of institutionalized hypochondria, it's going to have a absolutely enormous effect on on the, the psychological well-being of the population, especially young people, I think. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, again, another, an, this is another harm that we absolutely need to invest in trying to, trying to reverse, but let's not pretend it didn't happen. Did you know that there's tons of brilliant Netflix content out there that you're probably not aware of? And with ExpressVPN, you can unlock all of it. Normally, when you log into Netflix, you can only watch the shows that are made available in the country you live in. But with ExpressVPN, it lets you securely change your online location so that you can access a whole world of content that's available in over 90 countries. For instance, I used ExpressVPN to watch one of the best films of the past decade, Parasite, on Canadian Netflix. This film swept the Oscars in 2020, and for good reason. As I wrote for Spiked at the time, this was one of the few best picture winners in living memory that really deserved that title. To watch it, all I had to do was open the ExpressVPN app, change my location to Canada, and when I hit refresh, the film was right there. So why choose ExpressVPN over other VPNs? For a start, it's compatible with all your devices, phones, laptops, media consoles, smart TVs, and more. And it's not just Netflix, it works with other streaming services too. So if you're outside the UK, then you can use it to watch BBC iPlayer. And for UK listeners, you can watch it to access content on Hulu. So be smart. Stop paying full price for streaming services and only getting access to a fraction of their content. Get your money's worth at expressvpn.com slash Brendan. Don't forget to use our link at expressvpn.com slash Brendan, and you'll get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. I want to ask you about the developing world as well, because you've already mentioned the the consequences of the suspension of education in parts of the uh, uh, the South, in Bangladesh and Uganda. But there were other consequences too, weren't there, of, of, of shutting down so much of production, so much of trade, so much of the global interaction that makes life possible and which will obviously have more dire consequences for people who live on the edge anyway. But um, in relation to parts of Asia and parts of Africa, the lockdown has had pretty significant consequences in terms of health and even life. Absolutely. Right. So, um, you know, uh, this is one of the great success stories of the last 30 years. A hundred million people lifted out of dire poverty. Dire poverty means $2 a day or less of income in the global South, in, in among the poor of the world. And uh, that, that was an enormous success. I mean, a billion people lifted out of poverty over the last 30, 20, 30 years relative to what the rates that existed 30 years ago. Um, over the last two years, that that progress has been reversed. A hundred million people thrown into to dire poverty. The consequences of that are almost impossible for Westerners to imagine. Uh, tens of millions of people have been thrown into, into starvation. Effectively, the UN in March of 2021 issued a report estimating that 230,000 children had died of starvation in South Asia alone up to that point. 
230,000 children. And I bet you that's that's an underestimate. The consequences of poverty are devastating. And, um, and Brendan, you actually hit on the head why it happened or how it happened. We, we globalized the world economy. What did that do to poor countries? Did, in part, what it did to poor countries is that they reorganized their economies to fit in with the rich parts of the world. Uh, and when you reorganize your economy, you're dependent in some sense on the rich parts of the world, keeping its promises about trade and so on. Uh, when those promises are broken, the people that feel the harm the most are the people at the bottom, right? So people who they lose their jobs overnight, then there's no savings. They live on two dollars a day or less of income. There's no, there's no way to to protect themselves or their family, and so they starve. Let me just give you one telling example in India when the lockdowns happened, or lockdowns were imposed in in 2020, there were uh, 10 million people migrant workers living in the big cities of India. And they live hand to mouth. Essentially, what that means is they buy food, they buy, I don't know, mangoes or or coconuts or something, and they sell them, like in the streets of Mumbai to the the richer people that that, that live there. They take the money, they buy the wares for the next day, and then they feed their family with it. When the lockdown hit, those mangoes, those 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 coconuts, they, they just went bad. No one was on the street to buy them. And the prime minister of India told those 10 million workers, they needed to go back to their home villages overnight, within days. People have called this the new trail of tears. A thousand of them died on the route back to their home villages, crushed in overcrowded trains. Many, some of them, like they had to bike or walk home. Huge numbers of them, and some many died en route. Um, it was an absolutely cruel policy. And with no thought to the living circumstances of, of these people who are, you know, they're the least well off on, on the earth. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about how lockdown was enforced and how it was managed. So you, you used a great term there where you talked about institutionalized hypochondria. And I want to ask you about the deployment of fear and the use of fear to control how people behave, which I think was one of the more sinister aspects of the lockdown. Now, the politics of fear and the culture of fear have existed for a long time. They expressed themselves through different political issues. But there was, certainly in the UK, there were open discussions, or rather, not necessarily open, but there were definitely discussions within the political establishment about how to ensure that people were scared enough to change their behavior. There were discussions about how to manipulate how people think about the virus and how they respond to the virus and to the lockdown. I think people underestimate the consequences of fear on society too, because we all know the consequences of disease and we all know the consequences of COVID-19, especially for older people. We're, We're very conscious of that. But the consequences of fear can be quite destructive of the social fabric and and social solidarity. And they can be quite long lasting, can't they? Absolutely. I mean, I think, um, you know, as as humans, we have this built in this primal instinct almost to fear uh, infectious disease. One of the great advances of civilization has been to temper that fear, in part in reality, because we, you know, in the West anyways, have conquered the, the, so many of the infectious diseases that plagued uh, people forever. Um, you know, and, and the, the, the ones that left were things that happened to other people, HIV or something, right? Or, or all those other tropical diseases. They don't ever happen here, right? But, you know, that's not necessarily bad in, what, in a sense, like we, by conquering it, that fear, that, that that sort of primal instinct to to, to stay away from uh, from people who have diseases, it should it needs to be conquered. It's part of civilization to conquer it. But when it returns, it it allows people, good people, to make these distinctions between clean and unclean, uh, to shun shun the other. Uh, that I think is at the root of a lot of the policy we have been um, adopted. Certainly, the root of lockdown. And I think it is absolutely irresponsible of governments to use the techniques of behavioral economics, behavioral psychology to induce fear. I saw a report in the UK that there was a subgroup of SAGE, which actually specifically used behavioral economics and and behavioral psychology techniques to induce fear. Incredibly unethical. Uh, In the US, I haven't seen official reports, but it's it's very clear if you look at the official pronouncements of people like Tony Fauci, who went on TV night after night, essentially stoking panic. Uh, You know, in in the early days of the pandemic, I I still remember him talking about the risk to children 
the, the severe risk to, to children of, of something which turned out to be a rel- very, very rare outcome of, of a disease called MISC. Uh, but with that fear, with, with his appearance on TV and L, uh, stoking f- fear and panic, he, that led to the school closures in the U.S., um, the, the demand for lockdown is a consequence of these techniques, these psychological techniques used by governments, echoed by media around the world. And it, uh, it's something that needs a careful look and an introspection and reform, frankly, because there needs to be guardrails around that. It's too powerful a force, and it induces all kinds of harm. Um, which we should, I, I thought public, a principle of public health was to calm the public, even when there's danger not to use the fear to, in order to induce behavioral change, which is exactly what happened. And I, I think one of the tragedies of the, the conscious deployment of fear to control how people behaved is that it grated against how many people quite naturally responded to the virus when it first hit, which was to galvanize their communities, to try to encourage a sense of solidarity. In the UK, for example, very early on when COVID-19 arrived here and there was discussions about potentially locking down, we saw the creation of neighbourhood community groups who were shopping for elderly people or fetching medicine for elderly people, trying to ensure that people could elderly people could carry on without necessarily getting infected. Uh, lots of people were donating blood and, and taking other forms of local initiatives to help people through this pandemic. And then there was a switch in the government approach all of a sudden, which said, actually, what we're going to use is it, we're going to terrorize you rather than galvanize you. So instead of looking to you as communities who could help us through this period, we're going to terrorize you as individuals and force you to stay in your homes through the culture of fear. And that was such a terrible error, I think, that was made by so many governments in the West. And one thing I wanted to ask you in relation to that specifically was in terms of the suspension of civil liberty that we've all experienced over the past two years, completely unprecedented in modern times. In the UK, for example, there were laws about how and when you could leave your own home, where you could go, how often you could go outside, uh, what you could buy in shops. I mean, just absolutely ridiculous stuff. How do you think, or why rather, do you think that suspension of civil liberty was tolerated by so many people? Is it because the culture of fear was so successfully deployed? Is it because there was an already growing suspicion of freedom or or, or a kind of um, distrust in freedom? Why do you think this historic suspension of freedom was tolerated by large numbers of people? That's a great question. So I, I I do agree with you about the fear, but let me let me first start with the with your first part of your question because I think I think it's so insightful. That sense of solidarity, that sense of like sort of local local knowledge where we where we care for one another, that I think is at the heart of why places like Scandinavia did so well. Actually, like that kind of solidarity where public health tells you here's who is at risk. Um, in fact, that's what I was hoping when we wrote the Great Barrington Declaration was to induce that kind of local conversation about how best to protect the vulnerable among us. Um, because, you know, the living circumstances vary so much across places. No one person or one group, small group of people could ever know. Um, your question about civil liberties is also incredibly important. Um, I had a conversation with Jonathan Sumption, Lord Sumption, who was a, the UK, former UK Supreme Court Justice, also served as a, a expert uh, in a whole bunch of uh, anti-lockdown cases around the world, uh, you know, sort of, sort of pro bono, because I've been so incensed by the, the violation of civil liberties. I think the fear played an absolutely essential role in allowing those civil liberties to be to be uh, rescinded without without much pushback. Courts around the world essentially stopped doing their job. I mean, as courts in uh, the U.S. and the U.K. that have as, as as one of their mandates to push back against governments that violate basic civil liberties, the right to education, the right to speak, uh, the right to worship, all of those are basic fundamental rights that were just violated without a second thought by governments around the world. Um, and the courts, in part, they didn't push back because there's fear by on the part of judges of COVID itself, which I've seen, like the people actually, the judges themselves are human. But the other thing that they feared, many of the judges, is that if they were to push back and say, look, no, that you're violating a basic civil liberty, they would get accused of killing people, letting people die, letting it rip. 
So essentially, again, there's another inversion that that we I never expected to see, but what we what we're here, which is this this placement of safety of biologic safety above all other human values, including fundamental ones like the basic civil liberties you talk about. And now this is another another uh, manifestation of this, which really bugged me during the epidemic, is are these travel restrictions. You remember when, um, when Omicron first hit, it was the South African um, doctors who very bravely told the world what was happening. You know, and they, they also gave reassuring news that it seemed like it was producing a lower case fatality rate than the previous variants. The reaction of the West to that was essentially to ban travel from South Africa. You know, why would you why would you do that, right? So like a normal, like it, there's sometimes justifications of travel limitations when you have a disease where it's really endemic in one area and not in others. So you, you want to protect the disease from breaking out to the rest of the world. But this is a disease that's everywhere. What possible medical or epidemiological justification can there be for these kinds of travel restrictions? There just isn't one. Is the U.S. cleaner than South Africa? No. Is the U.K. cleaner than South Africa? No. Um, why then impose travel restrictions as if some countries are clean and some countries are unclean when you, in fact, have a situation where the disease is everywhere? There is no clean. Yeah, absolutely. And I felt in that moment that South Africa was punished for actually doing something that was very useful for the world, which was pretty accurately describing this new variant and what it was like and what it was doing. So uh, I think that was one of the unforgivable moments of, of the recent uh, uh, COVID experience. Okay, you mentioned there the Great Barrington Declaration. And of course, I have to ask you about the Great Barrington Declaration, which I think was a very sensible document. But there are other people who don't think that, uh, as you will know. So the Great Barrington Declaration was launched uh, by you, uh, Martin Kuldoff, and Sunitra Gupta. It was essentially an argument for focused protection, although if you listen to some of the pushback against it, you'd think it was some kind of neo-fascist document that wanted to kill off lots and lots of people. The first thing I want to ask you about, I suppose, is the hysterical response to the Great Barrington Declaration. Because one of the things that worried me from the very beginning of lockdown, right back in March and April 2020, was the lack of interest in free, open discussion about whether this was the right course of action to take. And I could feel that in the atmosphere very early on. And then the Great Barrington Declaration comes along and it just the response really confirms that one of the freedoms that was suspended in this period was freedom of conscience, freedom of thought, freedom of dissent, and freedom of speech. Because the flack that you guys got for putting forward an alternative view on how to respond to COVID-19 was just extraordinary. So could you ex tell us a little bit about what that was like and, and what kind of pressure you guys came under for putting forward those kinds of arguments? So uh, f first, let me just say that the, the Great Barrington Declaration, as much as fond as I am of it, was not original. Um, <laughs> it was the, the traditional public health approach to respiratory pandemics that have, that's worked for a century. The key ideas are identification and protection of the vulnerable, um, and then minimizing the disruption of the rest of society. Underlying it is this idea of like good communication with with people, public health and, and, and society, to tell people who really are at risk it's essentially the way that we've handled respiratory pandemic after respiratory pandemic for a century. I think we wrote with some style, but it was not an original <laughs> idea. And in fact, even in the early days of the pandemic, you saw various public health officials and infectious disease specialists essentially saying we should do that, right? If you remember the, when uh, President Trump first imposed the travel ban in February 2020, there was a big pushback said uh, by, by public health people saying, well, is this necessary? All right, don't panic the pop population. And, uh, you know, closing schools wasn't really on the, the part of the playbook. None of this was part of the playbook. Um, so the Great Barrington Declaration happens in October 2020. I write it with uh, Sinatra Gupta of Oxford University and uh, Martin Kuldorf then of Harvard University. So you have, you know, I've never really cared all that much about, about credentials, but you have three people from Harvard, Stanford, and Oxford writing this alternate idea to, uh, to lockdowns. It has to get taken seriously. And, you know, in the context of October 2020, it was a controversial idea. Mm. You know, if I wrote in December 2019, no one would have paid any attention to it. And that controversy, I intended that controversy. I wanted to start a conversation because mm -hmm. I thought that the, 
the, the reason we wrote the, the, the declaration is because of the, the, the harms and the devastating failure of the lockdowns. We clearly needed an alternate strategy. And that's why we wrote, we, I wanted to start a conversation both with the scientific community and in the public at large about whether it was the right thing to do. And actually, the main thing I hope for is the engagement of the public health authorities, local public health authorities, to think more creatively about how better to protect the vulnerable. That's why focus protection of the vulnerable is a central idea. Uh, what we faced instead was just this absolutely torrid, incredible, nasty response from official public health. The words let it rip is a good example of this, Brandon. It's, those words don't appear in the Great Parenting Declaration. I never thought those words. I never, the idea never crossed my head about letting the virus rip. The, the central idea is focus protection of the vulnerable. And those words were first mouthed, I think, by Tony Fauci on TV discussing it. Um, it four days after we wrote the Great Parenting Declaration, we, we learned later, Francis Collins, the head of the National Institutes of Health, wrote an email to Tony Fauci calling me, Sinatra Gupta, and Martin Kuldor fringe epidemiologists. It's just a crazy, uh, a crazy thing to see from the head of the National Institute of Health. He's a, he funds the careers of you know, countless scientists. And when he says somebody, somebody's on the fringe, scientists pay attention. Like, you, you, you silence yourself. And then he called for a devastating published takedown, which then Tony Fauci responded with a Wired magazine article, with, which got like basically everything wrong discussing the, the Great Branching Declaration. It led to this like ascent of, I mean, I don't know what to call it other than a propaganda campaign. It was, it was a propaganda campaign to demonize us, to silence debate, essentially to help, tell people, don't even think about talking about this idea. It's so far out there. When it wasn't, it was the, the, the standard way. And in fact, it's the policy that we finally have arrived at. The UK, I think, finally arrived at it sometime in like summer 2021, and the US sometime, you know, March of 2022. And so I think it's it's one of these things where like the scientific arena that I thought I lived in, which is which is filled with controversy, should, should be, but it's also tempered by data with very few restrictions on what sorts of ideas one, one might talk about, that was thrown away. It, uh, Martin Coulter called it the end of the Enlightenment. And he's not wrong. Right, the Enlightenment depends on on people being able to o- openly disagree with each other without be, without fear of smearing and cancellation. That is exactly what we experienced during the, p- the pandemic to p- any to ideas that were outside the mainstream in the, on the fringe, if you will. Where does wokeness come from, and whose interest does it really serve? These are some of the key questions in How Woke Won, the brilliant new book by Joanna Williams, soon to be published by Spiked in partnership with John Wilkes Publishing. To celebrate its publication, Joanna will be joining me for a special live edition of this podcast, and you can be there too. It's on Zoom on the 16th of May at 7pm. Tickets cost just £5 and they are now on sale to everyone. You can book yours now by going to spiked-online.com slash events. Or if you're a Spike supporter, you can sign up for free. Just go to the Spike website, log into the supporters hub, and you can register with one click. If you're not a Spike supporter, why not sign up today and claim your ticket by going to spiked hyphen online.com slash supporters. That's spiked hyphen online.com slash supporters. The great benefit of the Great Barrington Declaration was, uh, I think the, the declaration itself was very good, but what was most beneficial from it was the response to it, because I actually think it was one of the most telling moments of the entire lockdown period, because what it demonstrated very clearly, and I know lots of people who who started to change their minds a little bit about lockdown once they saw the response to this pretty humble proposition of 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 approaching this virus in a slightly different way and i think what it confirmed is that dogma took over reason and politics took over science and when you have someone like Fauci essentially engaged in a propaganda campaign against three scientists who are doing what Uh, scientific thinkers ought to do, which is to think critically and to think differently about how the world is organized and what we're doing. When you see that that kind of being demonized in the way that it was, I think that was an an incredibly revealing moment about what lockdown represented, which was not necessarily a reasoned thought through response to a new virus, but rather something that was much more tyrannical and 
authoritarian and would brook no discussion and no dissent whatsoever. So uh, one thing I wanted to ask you in relation to that, and you you just cited uh, Martin Kuldoff there saying this is the end of the Enlightenment. I wanted to actually touch on that with you because the response that you guys got does actually undermine science itself, doesn't it? Because science is about surely falsifiability, uh, putting forward your hypotheses and invite actively inviting skeptics and doubters to to question it and to find holes in it and to see if it really stands up. Science is a is a very rigorous and ideally quite free process in which you arrive at the truth through examination and criticism. So the response to the Great Barrington Declaration demonstrated that science was also sacrificed at the altar of, of the dogmatic response to, to COVID-19. Yeah, I mean, I think well, the way you describe science is, um, I mean, it, that's what makes science fun. Right, so you have a you have an idea. Maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong. Or, you know, most often it's wrong because nature is hard to understand. You you put it out there, and then all the fellow scientists are, are piling on. Yeah, you know, but it's not actually personal. They're not piling on you. They're like testing the idea out, see if it works relative to the data. It's that that process is why I, I loved my career up until twenty twenty. <laughs> it's really fun, you know. And, and uh, you have this like opportunity to meet with people who are open-minded in about about the, the way the world works you're going to learn things i mean just automatically um what happened during the pandemic was not that process a, a small group of scientists who unfortunately led and uh, controlled incredible amounts of, of policy and funding decided they knew the right thing and that any opposition was itself ipso facto dangerous Right. You have actually you had Jeremy Farrar in the UK who runs the Wellcome Trust, a major funder of scientific research. He wrote in his book, this uh, I think it was called Spike, that he when he saw the Great Barrington Declaration, he viewed it as a crisis, mm. and he conferred with Dominic Cummings, who I guess is a is a is sort of the conciliar to uh, Boris Johnson at the time. And uh, Dominic Cummings wanted a much more severe lockdown, and he conferred with Boris Cummings uh, with with Dominic Cummings to uh, essentially to figure out ways to destroy this conversation. I can tell you from uh, from talking to Sinatra Gupta, she felt the brunt of it in the UK with ridiculous smear piece after ridiculous smear piece put in the media meant to essentially demonize her. So I think I think this is one of these things like if you if you have an environment that does not permit scientists to talk to one another freely without this without fear of this kind of smearing, you you don't have science. You have something else. Yeah, and it's always struck me I I I'm not a scientist but I I completely recognize your description there of how science should work, how, how, how ideally it would work. But it's always struck me that this idea that in a time of crisis, we can't be bothered with the luxury of freedom of dissent and freedom of thought. I've always thought that's completely wrong. And it's surely it's in a time of crisis or in a time of difficulty or in when there is a new problem on the horizon that you need as free and wide ranging a discussion as possible so that we can work out, are we taking the right approach? Have we thought about the health impact of what we're doing? Have we thought about the psychological impact? Have we thought about the social impact? All of those things which we clearly did not think about and and the consequences of that are growing all the time. So isn't it the case that this notion that because things are pretty hairy and there's this new virus around and it's killing elderly people in particular and therefore we cannot afford the luxury of of science essentially and freedom that's completely the wrong approach right you're absolutely right you're absolutely right Brendan. i mean think about this like it's a new disease there isn't anyone on earth that's truly an expert and both the disease itself and the response to it touches every life on earth every single one in ways that are almost impossible to, to enumerate at least fully so you have a situation where there really is we really do need every single mind yeah focused on this. And at that single moment, a small group of people decide they know best, that they they can organize all of society around their wisdom, their knowledge, and that anyone that opposes them is dangerous. They are advising, pol you know, politicians, most of them that I've, I've interacted with, I mean, they're trying to do their best, but they don't understand the science of this. They're um, And they're looking at, at scientists that are very high level scientists, prominent ones, controlling funding, telling them that only this idea works, they don't really know to push back. I mean, there are a few, few exceptions I've seen, like uh, in Florida, the governor DeSantis, 
who actually went and read the epidemiologic literature himself. I mean, I know from first, because I've talked with him, we, it's clearly he has, but there's, that's, a, that's, that's the exception. That's something we never, generally wouldn't expect of politicians. You, you have, a, so, so you have the responsibility of scientific leaders to enforce the thing that you talked about, which is to let science, science happen. Mm. Scientific leaders need humility. And what happened here is the exact opposite. They, this, you had hubris on the, on the part of scientific leaders who decided they knew best, and they got their way with the policy. They got their lockdowns. That's very well put. I think humility in in matters in times of crisis and in 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 intellectual terms can actually be a very good thing in terms of the necessity of discovery and self criticism and always rethinking what you're saying, why you're saying it. All those things I think are very beneficial and were put on the back burner during this very curious period in in human history. Okay, to to bring things to a close, I want to ask you. Something which I think is probably the most controversial question uh, of the past two years, which is whether lockdowns work. Now, it, to my non scientific mind, even though I am very critical of lockdowns as an approach, and I think they will have very problematic consequences for a long time to come, I've always thought that, however, they must work at some level because if you shut everyone into their homes and people aren't interacting, then the virus can't spread, it can't move around. And even though I acknowledge that once you let people out again, which you must inevitably do, the virus will start to spread. You, you know, you can lock it in a cupboard for a period of time, but it will come out. But there is growing evidence, isn't there, that there is not much correlation between authoritarian suppression tactics and saving people from COVID. So it increasingly looks like even countries that had pretty severe lockdowns tended to do not particularly well when it came to limiting the number of COVID fatalities. So how do you explain that? How do you explain the fact that what has been presented to us as entirely logical, which is if you lock down society, people won't die from COVID, that has not actually been the case. So the, the key to understanding this is that Human societies are not rats in cages that can yeah. be moved and, and apart and or brought together at the will of the experimenter. Human societies are far more complicated than that. So we touched on this when we first, from the beginning of the conversation, we talked about uh, what fraction of people could actually afford to work from home. In, in the United States, 30%. People need interactions with each other. And, and even the most draconian government interventions to, to reduce those interactions eventually are going to fail. Uh, you know, Shanghai, you're seeing massive outbreak of cases despite incredible efforts to essentially keep people in their house uh, to the point of so they can't even get food, killing family dogs, family pets, cats, forced quarantines, separation of ch children from from parents, um, all of these things in, in, in service in the idea of like making people apart from each other still hasn't worked. The key to understanding why lockdowns failed in the West is the inequality of the West, actually. Right, so you have a situation where only a certain class of people could really truly afford to separate from society, reduce their interactions. Most of the rest of society couldn't afford to do that for an extended period of time. And as a consequence of that fact, the lockdowns were doomed to failure. So it's not surprising that when you look at real world data on the correlation between lockdowns and COVID deaths, you, you really don't it's hard to find one that's consistent and, and strong all the way across. I mean, you can you can tell situations where, okay, the lockdown seems to have done something here, but in the long run, the cases come anyways. Now, there's this controversy in the scientific literature, because there actually is a literature that suggests the lockdowns save lives. But most of that literature is based, in fact, all of it is based on these models that have failed. They, they, you know, These models, essentially, what they do is they project out a very simple model of human interactions. And they say, okay, if I keep people apart, the cases won't spread. And so like, for instance, the Imperial College model is a model like that. They're called, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, agent-based models. And it was, essentially what happens is like a video game, right? And then <laughs> in the video game, if I put a lockdown, people don't connect with each other. And as a result, the disease spreads less and um, you, you flatten the curve, right? But human societies don't actually work like that. And the, and the literature that tends to find that, that lockdowns worked assumes that the models are right. That they're actually an accurate depiction of human societies when they're not. 
Um, and I think that's really the fundamental thing. I mean, I think I don't I don't see how anyone looking at the real world data can can conclude that somehow the lockdowns have actually protected anybody from from this disease over the course of the last two years. Maybe for short periods of time, but that's it. Okay, so Jay, my final question is how optimistic you feel that lessons will be learned from what we've done over the past two years. I mean, this, this extraordinary experiment, it's always struck me as very odd that Sweden's more relaxed approach to COVID was referred to as a terrible experiment on human society, whereas it seems that the lockdown was a far graver experiment that was conducted on all of us. I want to ask how how optimistic you feel that we will learn the lesson. So uh, I, I feel quite convinced by your arguments that human society is far more complex than the lockdown uh, activists will allow, that freedom and scientific interrogation are incredibly important, particularly in times of crisis when we're working out how to respond to something that's strange and new, and also that the impact of lockdown needs to be factored into this discussion and it's more complicated but no less devastating potentially than the impact of the virus that visited our shores over the past couple of years. How optimistic do you feel that, I guess, that people like you and Kuldoff and Gupta will be vindicated in some way, or at least that society will start to learn that when there is a pandemic on the horizon, we need to think very carefully and very freely about how we should respond in a reasoned way? I, I mean, I'm actually quite optimistic in the long run, because um, that conversation is I think it absolutely has to happen. That, and I think it's already happening. I mean, I, I don't think that, um, like, you know, if you went to July of 2020, probably most people thought the lockdowns were, were the right thing to do. Now, I don't think that that's true. I think the majority understands that it was a failure and they've seen, and seen the cost of it and the harms of it. So I do think that that conversation will happen. There are tremendous interests to make sure that the conversation doesn't mm-hmm. happen or doesn't happen honestly. Right, ranging from prominent government officials, politicians, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, a whole bunch of other folks who were very strongly in favor of lockdowns and with prominent positions to 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 back it up, that were just wrong. Like they're not used to being wrong, but they just were. And I think that they will play a a role, and and they should play a role in in that conversation. But I I think the main thing that we shouldn't allow is to let them control the conversation and prevent it from happening, because they do have an interest in doing that. But I don't think they'll succeed. I, I am very optimistic that this conversation will happen. And, I, and, I, and I'm not in any doubt whatsoever what, where the, the conclusion will lead. Because just look around. Like, have the lockdowns worked? Have they actually protected anybody truly? Have they, what, what harms have they caused to the poor or the working class? They're just too great to ignore. Jay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you for listening to The Brendan O'Neill Show. We'll be back with another guest and more discussion. Don't forget to subscribe. And in the meantime, keep reading Spiked at www.spiked-online.com.